As a U.S. congressman's wife, this Greek immigrant would not be silenced. Popular as a talk show guest for her conservative views and opinions, she could be strong and in control, but always with a smile. But there were changes coming. In the late 90s, she and her husband divorced, and her political views shifted. Now well known for her liberal stance, she ran for governor of California in 2003 and founded the extremely popular website, The Huffington Post. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with author, activist, and columnist, Ariana Huffington. first time I had an opportunity to talk with you, you had just published The Fourth Instinct. Does that still stand today? Absolutely. It was actually 1994. Yeah. And um, The Fourth Instinct, which is about uh, the instinct that takes us beyond the first three that everybody agrees we have, you know, survival, sex, and power. The Fourth Instinct is the instinct that drives us to find meaning in life, to make a sense of life, to find a purpose beyond our own um, material pursuits. And what is fascinating about this new book, Third World America, is that in the final section, which for me is the most important section, the section about solutions, I talk about the need to tap into our fourth instinct. Because we may all disagree about what the role of government is, and government has a huge role to play in preventing us from becoming a third world country. But also, we have a huge role to play, and we have a choice to make, whether we tap into that fourth instinct and approach our life um, with that sense of commitment, not just to our own lives, but to our community, to the people around us who need help. And as I was writing this book, I was stunned by the numbers of Americans around the country who are doing just that, even when they've lost jobs, even when they've lost homes. I'm curious, though, for the casual observer, the person that wrote The Fourth Instinct would seem a very different person than the person you are today. They would think politically you were in a different position, all that. Is that correct? Is there a different Ariana today than back then? I wouldn't say a different person. I think that There's a constant evolution in all of us. And uh, I have done my evolution in public. So since I think my thoughts aloud, and I write them in books, you know, people know what I'm thinking. And very often, you know, we all kind of are thinking about a subject and then we see another angle to that subject. So in my own evolution, there have been certain things that have been constant and certain things that have changed. The constant have been that sense that we have a responsibility for the least among us, as the Bible puts it. Right. And, I, and I feel that this is part of every religion. This is part of uh, um, every humanistic tradition. And um, when I was a Republican, um, which was when I was here for the fourth instinct, I thought that the private sector had the real responsibility, that government wasn't going to solve these problems, right. but we had to solve these problems. And my shift was that I saw that these problems were so enormous that we also needed the raw power of government appropriations, and that government was in any case in the game. Yeah. I mean, government is making choices all the time. I mean, she's, government is giving subsidies, government is regulating, government is producing a safety net. So then we had to ensure that government was making the right choices. Right. But before we get into all of that, I'm curious, in the shift part, was it you actually shifting or was the playing field changing? Were Republicans getting more conservative? Was the Democratic ideal hitting more toward the middle? Were you pretty much standing still and the world was changing around you? No, I was changing too. I think... um, Right now, of course, um, the world is changing around me a lot faster (laughs) (laughs) Um, with what's happening within the Republican Party, with the Tea Party movement, with what's happening um, with the incredible anger and frustration at the political process that have been unleashed around the country. Mm -hmm. 
take me all the way back then. When did all of this begin for you? When did you have this sense of purpose in life? Well, I was very blessed to have been born in, in Greece, in Athens, and to have a mother um, who was um, entirely self-taught, but a sort of lifelong learner. I mean, she was constantly reading and underlining books and teaching us things. And uh, she always made us feel that we could um, strive for the stars, whatever we wanted to do, and that if we failed, that was fine. Yeah. And that is the greatest gift that I think a parent can give a child, the gift of knowing that failure doesn't matter. You know, so often, you know, children grow up so terrified of failing that they never try to mm -hmm. do what their dream, to make their dreams come true. So in my case, when I literally looked at a magazine one day in Athens and we came from, you know, a family that was living in a one-room apartment and and um, my parents were divorced. My father was um, constantly starting newspapers, which were constantly failing. So he would go bankrupt. We would have no money. Then he would raise a little more money. He would start another newspaper. So that was his dream, mm -hmm. which made our, our existence very precarious. And I was looking at a magazine, and I saw a picture of Cambridge in England. And I was 14. And I said to my mother, oh, I really want to go there. And everybody else around me said, don't be crazy. And my <laughs> mother said, let's make sure you go there. What was it that drew you to it? What was it about that picture that you wanted to go there? I don't know. There was something about that place that was, that was like um, a place where you could go and really engage in ideas and really understand things and, and also be surrounded by extraordinary beauty. Yeah. And... Um, I worked really hard. At the time when I saw that picture, I barely spoke English. <laughs> so I had to literally learn English as a second language, take my exams, uh, go and take an entrance exam. And, um, and I got a scholarship, and I, I got in. And it was, um, it was really the turning point. But what do you think gave you the drive? So many people have a dream. They'll see that image of someplace they want to be, and they'll truly want to go there but then they can't get it together. What gave you the, the gumption is the best word I can think of. You know, I always think of, of how I could never have done it without my mother. Yeah. Because I think when we can become enablers of each other's dreams, that is such a special thing to do. And she was, she was an enabler of my dreams because without her, I could not have made it. Yeah. What do you bring of those lessons to your children? Well... That's a big lesson for my children. You know, they go through different problems. You know, my youngest daughter is a big perfectionist, and she went through anorexia, which was a really tough challenge for all of us. And the lesson that we learned um, through her and that she learned was that when, as part of her therapy, she started volunteering at a place called Home in South Central Los Angeles, which I'm on the board of. It's a place for at-risk children in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It just really shifted a lot of things for her uh, in a way that could not have happened with me just talking about it. Right. Because she saw firsthand uh, what children were facing, you know, the dangers they were facing to their lives, um, how um, incredibly difficult their lives were. And so her own problems, all the things that she was concerned and worried and anxious about suddenly became very small. In some way, was there a point where you had that same realization for yourself? Because I'm thinking you were a political wife. You were in all of this that is seen as high society and all of that going on. Was there a turning point where you woke up and said, wait a minute, all the things this group is concerned with, really there's so much more out there. Was there something? Well, you know, th this group is very mixed. You know, the, the group of, of people who have solved all the financial problems, there are many people among them who are really engaged in doing things for others. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in my book, I profile, for example, Susie Buffett, who is Warren Buffett's daughter, and she took her foundation and basically used um, 
and is continuing to use everything in the foundation to make Omaha better, mm-hmm. you know, her own community. And I, I entitled that section, Find Your Own Calcutta, because Mother Teresa's expression, because a lot of people would go to her and say, I want to come to t- Calcutta and volunteer right. f- for you. And she would say, go find your own Calcutta. You know, they're all around us. They're communities and pockets of need. And so there are many people who do that and can have great lives themselves. What I discovered for myself is that life that is just about ourselves and just about success and money, etc., is never ultimately fulfilling. Yeah. There was something that I read that you had said where you said raising money, you thought that people going out and doing good would be easy. There's so many philanthropic people out there who care. But boy, it became easier to raise money for operas, for museums, for the arts. But when it came to the homeless and all of that, it became harder to get people engaged. And that's beginning to change now. And I think that's part of what I want to do, you know, with this book, to put the spotlight on the need Mm -hmm. and the fact that we actually all have a responsibility to step up and do something beyond what we've already been doing. Yeah. Okay, I'm taking you back to Cambridge now. You get there, how much was it like what you thought it would be, and how much was it a different world than what you expected? Oh, it was so different from my life. Remember, I came from this very tribal family, you know, where a <laughs> um, very close, neat family with my mother and sister especially. And at Cambridge, you know, I lived in this college, Girton College, where, uh, which was very gothic, my my room was the size of you and me together here like that. <laughs> and I had sort of, um, I had to feed shillings into the gas meter in order to get any heat <laughs> <laughs> and walk what seemed like a mile to the bathrooms and the showers. Yeah. So it, it was a very different and at first difficult existence. But what was amazing was the intellectual life. Yeah. Um, and I got very quickly involved in the Cambridge Union, which was the debating society. And I, I literally taught myself to debate. And that's another thing I tell people, because, you know, public speaking is supposed to be public fear number one, you yeah. know, public fear number two being death by mutilation. That gives you an idea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I just literally made myself get up at the end of each debate, I was probably the last called because I was so bad, and just learned to to use that muscle. Why did you know you needed to know that? Because what drove me is that there were things I wanted to say, and I knew that I had to learn how to speak in order to be able to communicate. Yeah. From there, you become a successful author. You marry into politics, easy way to put it, life different than for you? What you expected, not what you expected. Well, I I married in my mid-30s, so I had already written quite a few books and had by then moved to America from England. I married a Houstonian, yes. and in fact, we lived our first year in Houston, and um, we had two daughters who were sort of the center of our lives, and then even after our divorce, we really parented these two girls together. And um, I would come back to Houston regularly because I stayed close to my in-laws and my sister-in-law and, and had made lots of great friends here. So, so Houston was the beginning of my married life and then we moved to Washington. And um, Michael ran for Congress and then uh, he ran for the Senate and lost. And um, that was my introduction to politics, elect, elective politics. At what point did you realize it was something you loved? Assuming it is something you love, you might not like politics at all. <laughs> oh, no, I, I love politics. I, I, love, I love really both uh, um, the end result, because it's so critically important for people's lives. Do you still believe in the end result, though? Do you still believe that those people elected do you get the work done? Well, the end result is, is very important. Even when they don't get it done, it has a huge impact. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have a broken political system. It's not, 
it's impossible to avoid that conclusion. We have a system which is dominated by special interests. That's what makes us a little bit of a banana republic, you know, the fact that politicians um, are bought by special interests. I mean, that's another thing that makes us a third world America. If we don't stop it, it could get even worse. Yeah. And um, so I, I saw firsthand, you know, how the system works. Did it surprise you you were accepted in, in the political arena? No, one of the great things about America, which is different from England, is say having an accent doesn't matter. You know, Henry Kissinger could be Secretary of State. Yeah. That could never have happened in England. Um, in fact, when I, when I first met him, he said to me um, that you're going to discover the great advantages of complete and total incomprehensibility in American <laughs> public life. <laughs> so um, I immediately knew that being an immigrant was, again, part of the American DNA. Yeah. Having the history that you had, Looking at the current struggles and battles over immigration, what are your views on all of that? Well, that is really deeply, con deeply disturbing because it's what happens always um, in times of great economic anxiety. And in the book, I went back and looked at other times in history, the 1880s, when we ended up deporting Chinese workers the 1930s during Herbert, Herbert Hoover's time when we actually deported American citizens of Hispanic descent. Mm -hmm. So that's what concerns me, that in times like this, when people are li losing their jobs and losing their homes, or even if they're not yet losing them, they're worried that the other shoe will drop. Yeah. And that's when we have a tremendous responsibility to actually tap into our better angels, yeah. tap into our fourth instinct, to go back to the beginning of our conversation, in order to produce a sort of countervailing force uh, to those who are tapping into our basest instincts and bringing out what is worst in us. Do you think the same reasoning for all of that is what's going on at Ground Zero with the mosque debate? Is that the same situation? Oh, yes. I mean, it's you, you turn against immigrants, you you turn against Muslims, you turn against the other. And um, yes, what's happening uh, with the community center um, is really stunning. Mm -hmm. It's, um, to me, the fact that you have commentators saying 71% of Americans are opposing it is, is something which, the only way I can describe it is, imagine if when Rosa Parks refused to um, give up her seat on the bus. The commentators were leading with uh, 71, I'm sure it was 80% or 90% of people in Montgomery, Alabama opposed Rosa Parks. Right. Did that make Rosa Parks wrong? I mean, when did we suddenly become a country that decides what is right based on popular opinion? And I think that goes into so much, even since you have the Huffington Post, the media, there's such instant reaction to things, and there's not, not saying at the Huffington Post, but I'm saying in general, there's not fact-checking, things happen, things are said, even if a mistake is made and they go back and retract it, it's out there, things are moving, I sometimes worry too fast. Yeah, but the, you know, that's not the problem of the internet, trust me. You know, I think traditional media, uh, miss the two biggest stories of our time, with a few great exceptions. The fact that there were no WMD in Iraq and the financial meltdown. So I think that, sure, um, it's easier to quickly get misinformation out through the Internet, but it's also much easier to correct it and correct it transparently. Yeah. Um, okay, back then over. Now you're in the political arena. And all of a sudden, you're getting a lot of attention. You're appearing on TV shows. Was being a commentator, being involved in the national discourse, something you desired or something that just seemed to happen? Well, it's an, it's an extension of uh, wanting to influence the national conversation. You know, there are many ways to influence the national conversation. Um, the media, writing books giving speeches, you know, these are all ways in which we communicate with each other. And I find what's happening in social media is fascinating. I mean, I find 
this is going to be unprecedented, the, the role social media play uh, to bring people together in hard times. Mm -hmm. I mean, you now have, um, for example, um, a, a, a site called HelloWallet.com that came together um, to provide people with financial literacy at an affordable cost, like $5 a month. Yeah. Because so many Americans um, don't know about how to read a mortgage contract or a credit card contract. Yeah. Okay. The Huffington Post. You have done what so many people have set out to do and failed miserably, is being a success on the Internet. And not just a success, the pinnacle of success on the Internet. How did that come to be? I mean, it's nice to write a blog, but this thing just took off. Well, you know, when we started in um, in 2005, you know, we didn't know what would happen. There were plenty of naysayers, but I could hear my mother's voice saying, <laughs> just do it. And if you fail, you fail, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, from the beginning, what we wanted to do is to create a platform for people's I interesting opinions, whether they were well-known or not well-known. Now we have about 10,000 bloggers, plus, you know, thousands of submissions that our editors go through. Then it was 24-7 news. And increasingly, as we grew, as now we are profitable, we uh, hired reporters who are breaking stories and also doing it in our own way, which is staying on a story. Mm -hmm. Like um, about a year and a half ago, for example, we brought in Arthur Delaney to be our economic impact correspondent. And his one job is to put flesh and blood on the economic data. Because I feel that we need to tell more stories. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to just sit here and tell you 26 million people are unemployed or underemployed. You know, your eyes glaze over. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but if I say to you, you know, Brenda Carter that I write about in the book, you know, from Georgia, had the same job for 13 years, and one day she was fired. And what happened to her after that? You know, how did she rebuild her life after 13 years in the same company? Right. That connects with you. But how did you know, or what was it in what you were posting that brought the success that came with it? I think it was really the combination of a, a platform for really interesting voices, 24-7 news, and a very engaged community, which kept growing. I mean, right now we have about 3.5 million comments a month, for example. Well, what I think is funny is that it has become so big. There are people that know the Huffington Post and don't know that there's a you. That <laughs> it has become this a source. It is a New York Times. It is a London Times. It's become the note of record in a lot of ways. And it was funny one day... I called to make a restaurant reservation in New York, and I gave my name, and they said, is this like the newspaper? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's quite amazing. Now, there are some areas I'm curious about and your thoughts on. One is John McCain. I know back in 2000, you were a John McCain supporter. I'm curious. I was not a John McCain supporter in 2000. He was a friend, and I had launched the shadow conventions at right. the time, which were really saying that neither political party um, was offering solutions to three major areas. One was poverty and the growing inequalities, the need for campaign finance reform, and that's wh where I had really connected with John McCain. And um, the third one was um, the failed war on drugs. Right. And uh, John McCain very bravely agreed to open the shadow convention in Philadelphia where the Republican convention was happening, which was really kind of amazing given that, in a way, it was challenging his own political party. But, but that was that John McCain, right. the right. maverick. That, what I'm I, I know, when you use the term maverick now, it's almost a joke. When yes. we're what happened to the maverick, do you think, over the next eight years? Well, one of the things that happened, especially since the election, was really the, this complete um, obsession over everything else with doing whatever he thought he had to do to get reelected. So when he faced a primary challenge by J.D. Hayworth, he suddenly started adopting positions which were so contrary to who he was and what he stood for, but he felt that was the way to, to undermine his opponent. But what does that say about our political system in general, not to 
talk about him specifically, but that politicians will change their positions so that they can get elected, uh, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth, I think. Oh, I mean, there's tons of stuff that leaves a bad taste <laughs> <laughs> in our mouths about our politics. But we need to recognize that politics is not a spectator sport. Um, we sometimes naively think that we will um, come out every four years, not off, not really every two years because the midterm turnout is um, incredibly right. low. And we'll elect, let's say, Barack Obama, and he will go to the White House and change everything, and we can get back to watching television, watching you on television. That's not how it works. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think they should still watch me on television, they but should. I think they should watch you when you're on television and read your books and read your posts, and we are out of time. Oh, wow. It thank went that you. quick. Thank you so much for sitting down talking with us, and thank you for all the hard work you did. Thank you. Ariana Huffington. To order a DVD of this or any episode of interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.